Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Operation Climate Capstone event. Uh, it's crazy, but we've reached the end of our eight weeks together, at least for um, the internship program. But yeah, so today we're just gonna go over uh, primarily team presentations to showcase uh, all of the work you guys have been doing, but then we're going to go forth and award certifications and then close with the raffle prize winner slash uh, reflection. So to start off, um, I just wanted to open with a massive thank you to all of you guys as interns, not just for applying to the program, but also for all the work that you guys have contributed to forwarding Operation Climate's mission as a whole. Um, it's been extremely rewarding to work with you guys and see you guys learn and grow with us as an organization. Um, this internship program started really as just an idea in a brainstorming session, and we didn't expect much out of it, but lo and behold, all 36 of you guys are graduating from the program today and um, yeah, so it's been a crazy ride and I'm extremely happy to have seen the work that you guys have put in and yeah, so that's what I wanted to open with. And I also want to thank um, all of our team leads for supporting you guys throughout this whole process as well as the Operation Climate staff for um, helping us deliver the best experience possible for you guys. Um, you may not have had direct contact with them, but I promise that they have been crucial to helping us um, with everything. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it to our teams to showcase some of their work. Um, and for simplicity, we'll just go with the order shown here. So podcast first, then content creation, and lastly, research and database. So I will stop sharing and hand it off to podcast. Awesome. So I, I'll share my screen. Um, first off, I wanted to say to the podcast team, I've had such a great time working with you all this past summer. I think all of you have grown so much in your climate activism and storytelling and communication abilities. I love watching each and every one of you um, conduct your interviews in such a professional manner, like with these crazy world-renowned scientists and activists. So it's been great. Um, and I'm so excited to hear about your reflections. So um, I can go ahead and share my screen and I'll hand it off to you guys. And here we go. OC Capstone podcast team. So um, like every team is doing, we're gonna talk about our intro, what our projects were, um, what we did to produce our projects, some of the results we had, and then some reflections from the team. So I'm gonna introduce what we've been working on first, very briefly before I hand it off to the rest of the team. But our main goal this summer was to create three awesome interview style podcasts for Operation Climate. And those podcasts will be released on all podcasting platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts um, sometime in the fall when we produce our new season. And some other goals were to help um, help our team learn how to communicate climate issues um, in an engaging and effective way. And to do that, um, we all learned how to research, pitch stories, interview a variety of people, and communicate ideas that will help educate others about the climate crisis. So, um, brief overview of what we produced. So, in total, we produced three episodes. One of them is all about the clean energy revolution. Another one is about greenwashing and how we avoid it. And another one investigates um, the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders in the climate movement and what your role is. So without further ado, I will hand it off to our interns to speak about the process. So um, editing and feedback. So our goal for this assignment was to bring forth our own opinions, feedback, and changes. Not only did my peers and I learn about this process, but we were also able to apply it. For example, the flow, the way it was formatted from the beginning intro to the many transitions, and finally the end. Each part is very unique and has its own structure. 
By simply editing, we learned how to be more detail oriented, finding the small mistakes and refining them. The feedbacks that we also gave proved to be a gateway to expressing our own self. All in all, with the help of this assignment, my peers and I learned to take detailed notes, provide a third eye insight, and lastly, apply the flow. So after we got the chance to dissect different finished and unfinished episodes from Operation Climate, we moved on to one of my personally favorite components, um, researching and pitching stories. So essentially we had the liberty to delve into any environmental subject over choosing and pitch a story about it. We explained its background, its importance, and we proposed potential interviewees as well. Uh, most of us pitched just one story. I think Caroline went and pitched like six, but all of them were incredibly interesting and we really could have built an episode out of any of them. So throughout this process, we definitely learned a lot, but there were a few key themes. Um, this experience first gave us a chance to explore concepts and dive into a new topic and learn to hone in on the information that's most important. It also instilled in us a sense of hope really that change could actually be within reach. And lastly, we learned of the importance of selecting potential interviewees very wisely. You know, say you're creating a story based on clean energy, you may not want a representative from Exxon. If you're doing a story on the climate crisis as a whole, you still may not want a representative from Exxon. So researching and pitching as a whole was just one step along the way, but with so many different rewarding components attached. All right, the next step was cold emailing and generating interview questions. So for cold emailing, it was a bit intimidating to ask these people who are so accomplished in the climate movement and to ask them to be on our podcast. But in reality, most of our attempts were pretty good. And then for the interview questions, um, it was definitely hard to figure out what would work to ask the interviewee that the audience would also connect with. But I found it personally helpful to just think of myself as an audience member and figure out what I would want, not what I would want to hear, but what I would like to learn about. Um, so the final step was basically going through with these interviews after we cold emailed and sort of narrowed down like which interviewees we're going to have for each episode based on our topics and the research we did for that. And so um, just throughout the episodes, we interviewed like a variety of different people. So some examples listed that we might have looked for were scientists, scholars, or anyone that was an expert in the subject and had done research, or maybe some business leaders. Like I know mine was a lot into the National Retail Federation, the business component, um, and also some activists and people maybe from nonprofits. Um, so just like to recap what we learned from it overall. So part of it was just sort of keeping a good flow of conversation. And as I know Marissa mentioned, just sort of finding a way to keep it still conversational while also getting the information we sort of wanted from the episodes. And then um, I think uh, Raghav also mentioned how he was initially a little bit nervous about it but um, he quickly started to learn a little bit about transitioning and certain talking points and just like finding those moments where you can insert maybe a little bit of commentary or something that you hadn't initially scripted. I think um, Arshia, if you're here, you can go ahead. So when me and Raghav were putting this story together for our episode, um, well, I was a little intimidated, so I let him take the reins on that one. But uh, <laughs> we did well. It took us a lot of attempts, and um, I think we had to record three times because of mistakes that we made, or I guess I made a lot more mistakes in Rav on the first two attempts, but we finally got the third one and um, we did it somewhat better. Well, like it was decent. 
<laughs> we still made a lot of mistakes, but it was a lot better than the first two attempts. And uh, uh, I guess mistakes happen even in this setting. And it's just a lot more comfortable after having experienced it a few times. And the final product was really rewarding. And I enjoyed listening to the rough draft that we have of it that I think Catherine posted in the podcast internship chat. That's it for me. So um, these are our results. Um, allow me to be the first to say, welcome to the clean energy revolution happening all around us all the time. So I'm Raghav Akula. I'm from Morristown, New Jersey, and I'm a rising junior at Morristown High School. Arshia? So <laughs> I'm from Choctaw, Oklahoma, and I'll be a freshman at Case Western uh, next spring, and I'll be studying aerospace engineering. With the world reeling from the effects of the climate crisis, we desperately need to mitigate our fossil fuel use. We really just use this primary uh, folk idea as our focus for our um, interview. And we wanted to understand the true potentials of renewables and why they're taking so long to expand. And most of all, our team wanted to discern whether or not we could commit to a mass rapid transition to a clean energy economy. So our chosen interviewee hails from uh, Duke University, actually, and um, his name is Dr. Timothy Johnson. He's a professor of the practice of energy and the environment. He's the associate dean of professional programs, and he's the chair of the energy and environment program. His research and teaching topics cover a really broad range. It's energy system planning and uh, natural resource management and an analysis of like how these areas intersect to improve environmental quality and human health. He was really the full package for everything we were looking for, right? He covered economics and policy and governance um, and energy and technology. So that, if that light bulb of renewable energy on top of his head is technically fake on the slide, but I can assure you, it seems like it's there in real life all the time. So I would say that our main takeaway from the episode was really learning about all the real, the very real impediments to a clean energy revolution. First, we just haven't invested in enough research and development to generate the storage capacity and the efficiency needed for renewables to completely overtake the energy market. And economically, there will be hurdles overcoming the price differences and the demand, right? People only buy from clean sources if the prices are competitive, so lower, but prices will only become lower as demand increases, so more people need to buy. That's just a never-ending cycle. But the way to break that cycle is to have both individuals and the government resolutely favor renewables over other energy sources, and that will allow the clean energy transition to commence more naturally. We also had the opportunity to learn about all the important implications on financial and policy level, specifically how we need to give workers a seat at the decision-making table so that they're not left out in the process, what's many times referred to as a just transition. And we also have to be wary with government policy so that they don't unintentionally increase energy prices and burden low-income communities. But if done wisely, we can basically use the clean energy transition to emerge as a more socially just society on the other side. And Arshia, take us home, man. Uh, so what really surprised me was the stark like cost difference between renewables and fossil fuels in a lot of states, especially in the U.S. And it surprised me that we haven't like transitioned to clean energy in those places, despite the cost difference. And producing the podcast allowed us to see the issue through our guest size. And Dr. Johnson really was helpful and opening mine because I wasn't very learned on the issue. And I learned that we have a lot to learn from our seniors and superiors in this field.
Awesome. Thank you so much. This was, this was definitely a great episode and this is a great trailer also for when the episode actually comes out. So make sure you guys listen to it. Now we'll move on to the greenwashing team. Hello. So I'm Grace and I'm from Cary, North Carolina, and I'm a rising freshman for Duke University. So I might see some of the team leads on campus, maybe. Um, yeah, I'll let my friend Epi take it away. Hi, I'm Epi Camacho. I live in Raleigh and I'm a rising junior at Broughton High School. Um, so just like quickly about greenwashing. So just like I inserted a few pictures of like different weird looking labels that you might have like maybe seen on different packaging. So like just anything green basically that's saying like certified or like they didn't even spell that one right, but it's 100% organic or like some might say like sustainable or stuff like that. And like maybe you see that on like some products, you just kind of wonder like, are they even like actually are they environmentally friendly? So we, with this episode, we kind of just want to explore like which brands we could trust versus which one we're putting on some sort of like eco-friendly facade, quote unquote. And so then we tried to, for the episode, look at it from like a consumer point of view, which is more of the actionable segment, but also how it's enforced in terms of regulations. And then also what like the big companies' perspectives are from that. And then for... Based on our research, we decided to interview Mr. Scott Case, and he was the vice president for corporate and social corporate social responsibility and sustainability at the National Retail Federation. So basically, he's had a lot of experience working with different U.S. EPA certification organizations, such as like Energy Star or WaterSense. And so, like, I don't know if you guys have seen like an Energy Star label on different like refrigerators or um, I'm not sure what else, but any sort of energy appliances that are trying to be more efficient in their consumption. And then he also co-authored a report called The Six Sins of Greenwashing, which um, sort of like pioneered this whole like movement into researching this idea. So we definitely learned a lot uh, while making our episode and some of our main takeaways about greenwashing were you want to prioritize one category of products that you find most important, like you want to focus your environmental efforts on being, buying um, sustainable or environmentally friendly products in that category, because a lot of, there's a lot of research and it can be confusing. So if you wanna do it right, you kind of need to focus so you don't get on overwhelmed, don't get overwhelmed. And we talked to Scott Case, and he told us a lot about how important it is for us to be environmental advocates of greenwashing. And that's from social media, sharing information about greenwashing and researching to find what is actually honest in, like what labels are honest about being environmentally friendly or organic, sustainable, whatever the label says, and sharing that information that we find with friends and family so that they can also buy honest products that are what they say they are. And one final takeaway was that we were surprised that a lot of companies who use greenwashing, they don't realize that they're using it. They aren't, are just not educated on what they're saying. They haven't done their research. So you need to do your research so that you can make sure what you're buying is truly what it says it is. Yes, definitely. This is also a wonderful episode. Scott Case was a great speaker and Grace and Epi were amazing interviewers as well. Cool. So thank you guys. And now we'll move on to the final episode team, which is the uh, responsibility in the climate movement team. I'm Marissa Sims. Um, I'm from Defiance, Ohio, and I'm a rising senior at Fairview High School. I'm Madeline Bloomfield. I'm from Wellington, North Carolina, and I'm a rising senior at Hoggard High School.
Hi, I'm Caroline Chen. I'm from Beijing slash Lakefield. I'm going to be a rising freshman, not a rising. I, I guess I'm going to be a freshman at UNC Chapel Hill next fall. So the main point of our episode is if no one takes responsibility for the climate crisis, nothing will change. And I interviewed Heather Taylor Measley, who is the executive executive director of the Ohio Environmental Council. And she was a great interviewee. She's definitely really knowledgeable about the intersection of climate change and politics. Another takeaway from this episode was that it's counterproductive to push the blame on to someone else without taking action yourself. And my initial thoughts, because my responsibility lies largely with education, was um, that when you're teaching the younger generation to do something, it's shirking personal responsibility and leaving the blame with someone else. Um, but what I came to realize is that it's very counterproductive to try and get rid of your responsibility. Every individual must take responsibility. Um, I learned this by interviewing Drew Harrison. Um, she's the director and education coordinator at the New Hanover County um, Soil and Water District. Um, every county has a soil and water district and her responsibility is with uh, teaching youths and some individuals that are a bit more uncooperative. And she created outdoor learning centers by rising from an internship with um, New Hanover County Soil and Water to its director. Um, yeah, Drew was a great interviewee. I, I loved her accent. Uh, <laughs> so I so our That's third takeaway cool. is uh, we must all take responsibility and hold ourselves accountable by working together to fight the climate crisis. Uh, one of the reasons why we started working on this topic is because sometimes we all know who the top one person is, who the real culprit is, well, the, the government and the corporations, but it feels like hopeless that whatever we're doing as young activists, blah, blah, blah. But from interviewing all these people that um, we came to an understanding that even though we're just high schoolers or um, <laughs> college students, there's still, we, there's still so much we can do in terms of making systemic change. Um, so I first interviewed Iron and Ellie from Fridays for Future Toronto Youth, uh, sorry, Fridays for Future, the Toronto branch. Um, and Ellie is actually the founder of the Toronto branch. And I've just learned so much from them. And Erin is younger than me, I believe. It just how knowledgeable they are about the topic, about mobilizing young people. It just very inspiring to see. And then I interviewed Sona Stenoklova, which would be our corporation representative. And she is the advisory engineer with the Global Environmental Affairs and Sustainability, sustainability Team at the Novo. Uh, she was a great person. She seemed very knowledgeable. But um, I also learned from her that not all great people can be great interviewees. Sometimes you're under company obligation. You, you, you have to limit what you talk about. So that's one of the things that... <laughs> I learned in this process that sometimes you have setbacks, sometimes you set up an interview and it doesn't really work and you have to salvage what you have. So, yeah. All right, so the biggest takeaway for our episode is that everyone must take personal responsibility and do their part. Every action matters, no matter how small. So in our interviews, we talked a lot about how what young people can do um, to make a difference in the climate movement. And so I know in my interview, we talked about how young people can get out and vote and how young people can use social media and other platforms to really use their voices. And then the other thing is that we learned that there are many different perspectives on the climate movement, but everyone made it clear that we all need to work together to solve the problems. So we can't just point blame at other people. We really need to work together as a whole from all the stakeholders to fix the climate crisis. We were surprised by how many different ways there are to take action in the climate movement. We kind of went into the research thinking that either one takes responsibility or they don't take responsibility. But we learned that a multi-pronged approach actually helps to depolarize the subject 
of climate change and environmental education, and it gives non-believers an incentive um, to kind of change their belief system. Um, we also learned not to let the hopelessness that comes along with climate anxiety stop you from taking action. Um, like we were saying earlier, it's very easy to try and uh, shirk responsibility or when you feel that the top 1% holds all the responsibility, easy to get down on yourself and believe that you are meaningless in the grand scheme of things. Um, what we realize is that every individual is just one piece of a larger puzzle. And I learned from my interview that getting outside and seeing what there is to work and live for um, really reinstills a sense of hope. Um, like Madeline said, creating throughout the creation of this episode, our thinking has changed from directly pointing the blame on others. Like we were thinking through like a panelist style, who do you think the responsibility relies on into trying to work together as a team, as a collective against the climate crisis. And these are very bottom bottom line and broad takeaway. So be sure to listen to our, uh, to our episode for more detailed perspective from each stakeholder. Yes, that is awesome. This is definitely a very impactful episode. I hope you guys all listen to it when it comes out. And I just realized everyone on the episode is like an inspiring woman uh, climate leader. So that's really awesome also. So now really quickly, uh, we went over all of our episodes. Now we just want to quickly go over conclusions and reflections. So uh, Caroline, you can go ahead and take the first reflection slide. Oh, which is not this one. There we go. Hello again. Um, so my wonderful teammates has contributed to these takeaways and I kind of divide it up into two kind of streams or focuses. So in green, you can see all these people, Grace, Epi, and William, um, all reflected on the process from the beginning to finish, how rewarding it is to follow through an episode. And that's, I totally agree with that. Like how much work gets put into behind just one episode, 10 minutes or 20 minutes, I, it's incredible. I, I believe everyone on this team can agree. Um, and, uh, the the reflections in red reflected on working with other people and um in, in terms of in teams there's there's uh, there's compromises there's um there's always difficulties but there's also so much fun in terms of working in team we're put into well as you guys kind of see we were put into three teams and we were giving so much autonomy in terms of what we want to do and then we were really basically from strangers we were basically strangers from the start and now I guess I can call my <laughs> I guess I can call my teammates friends I can call my teammates friends and it's just a, a rewarding experience making friends with these people and um, one more thing I want to say is just that I really like the interview format of the OC podcast that that is centered on it just I didn't realize I, I like talking to people and learning about these things but then I realize that I do like these things so and yeah there's a lot of takeaways it's hard to but that's um I just want to thank um, everybody here and especially Catherine for making this not only um an experience that will enlighten interns and allow them to work towards a cause that's bigger than themselves but also to make this immersive for every intern and teach them things that they won't be forgetting when they go to college or when they start their senior year of high school. And um, it was a lot more than I was expecting. I even learned how to do a British accent while reading a weather report um, to loosen myself up when I was reading. But communication is something that I always am constantly trying to improve. And so we learn the ability to recognize an engaging story, um, effective research skills, communicating research, breaking down complex topics, ability to educate others, and engaging with guests in a prepared and professional manner. I think these are things that are going to be applicable no matter where you go. Having good communication skills and being able to get to the core of the information that you're studying will really benefit you no matter where you take your life. So since we worked in partners or small groups, we had to really work together to get the episodes done and make them great. So some of the skills we learned from that 
were leadership with the team, communicating and coordinating with the t- other teammates to get everything together, time management, organization, resourcefulness, accountability, and dedication throughout the whole process. And all of the things that we've just listed, they can all be applied to our futures and whatever careers any of us go into. And some of the paths that those can be applied to are science and engineering, education, public policy, journalism, broadcast, radio, television, writing, and research. So I've definitely learned a lot from this and I know that I'm gonna be able to apply it. Awesome. So that was the end of our presentation. Um, I wanna make sure that the other teams get a chance to present also. So if you have any questions for our team, feel free to send them in the chat and we'll answer them there. But thank you guys so much. Um, Podcast team was amazing this summer and I love all of you. Yeah, so content creation team, um, Grace, would you please share your screen, please? Yes. Well, I said please twice, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Grace is one of our first um, speakers, so I thought she could have the pleasure of sharing our presentation with you all. Um, but yeah. Share my screen. <laughs> Oh, that's weird. Is it showing or? I don't see it, but. That's weird. Um, share sound. Okay, this is gonna take a bit. <laughs> if you want that, I can, I can share the screen or? Uh, that's like, that'd probably be easier. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. We just have audio in ours, so. Okay, cool. Yeah, make sure, yeah, the audio thing is. Just a second, pulling it up. I'm so excited to see what the content creation team has done. You guys have a special surprise for us, so. Yeah, we're gonna gonna showcase something for you all <laughs> but uh okay cool awesome so just let me know when you want me to switch slides either by just saying like next slide please um yeah something like that cool amazing okay so i'm gonna introduce our presentation but um this is our capstone presentation this is our capstone, um, and there's 13 of us on the content creation team um, whose names are listed below. Uh, but yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, what well, all of you guys are talking about. Um, so the project that they've been working on. Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, and um, a deeper dive into our workflow and structure. Um, we have a special surprise for everyone here. And then lastly, the team will um, conclude with a reflection. So I'm gonna hand it off to Grace to start with our intro and background. So this summer, the content creation team produced several projects that were intended to one, communicate climate issues in an engaging way, and two, show each of our personalities, and then three, educate others and ourselves. Next slide. So I think Eileen is not here. I think she may have gotten the time zones mixed up, but I will present the slide um, for her. Uh, so each person on the content creation team was tasked to create three videos, two of which were um, primarily based off of the podcast, but one which could be entirely unique. Um, and they were also working on side projects in one of three teams, uh, merch design, infographic voiceovers, or infographic production. Um, and they'll talk about each of those later. But our three main goals was or were to create content that would tell a 
clear and concise narrative for our audience. Um, obviously, following the Operation Climate brand and our purpose, and we ultimately wanted to be proud of the things that we created for our friends. Yeah. Teamwork and feedback. Working together completely virtual through Zoom can be challenging, and everybody here probably experienced that. Uh, as a team, we learn communication and problem solving skills with group meetings, we are able to discuss and put our projects together. Working together, uh, we are able to provide excellent feedback to the team and assist each other on, on developing wonderful content ideas and aesthetic visuals, as well as learning how to make videos and design graphics using Canva and Audacity. So next we're going to talk about a um, deeper dive into the process. So the first part of the process was to make our video outlines, but before we could do this, we had to listen to all the Operation Climate podcasts to identify general topics and themes that we could possibly make our first two videos about. Then looking at all those different pieces of information, we decided on our three different topics. Something important we learned during this section was separating facts from perspectives since most of the podcasts interviewed someone. And so we had to make sure the information we, wish we were sharing was credible and it wasn't an opinion. And if it was an opinion, we had to explicitly share that so we wouldn't be um, sharing conflicting information. So the outline was made up of a few components, which were the learning objectives, um, the transcript sections, and these different sections were what we got from the OC podcast. But since we had to make voiceovers to add information, um, these would make the transition smoother. And so to do this, we had to research facts from credible sources and make scripts so we knew what to say. And then the last part of the outline was to pick music. So we had to keep in mind the qualifications of an appropriate tone, a light background beat, and it had to be copyright free. And then our team lead gave us individual feedback to make sure the content in our videos fit nicely and match the learning objectives. She also read over our voiceover scripts to make sure the information connected to the Operation Climate podcast audio. Uh, next slide, please. The second step to content creation is cutting the audio. To set up for everything, we first had to have all the right files and the software to do so. And so we downloaded the audio files of the podcast episodes that we needed in our videos, um, download our music files and install Audacity, which is the audio editing software that we used. Our work process in Audacity was then pretty straightforward. Um, it was simply placing the audio files into the software, cutting them and then adding the music. Um, however, um, this process it, um, can get pretty repetitive and um, tedious and time consuming um, to find the right places to cut the audio. Uh, lastly, we had to make some minor edits such as tweaking the volume of the files so that sort of um, they stay consistent throughout the video. And with those of us who had our own individual voiceovers, um, we needed to clean up the background noises in the audio and then import that into Audacity. The third step was a Canva workshop. Canva is an app that we use to actually edit and make our videos. First, we had to set up from a variety of templates and manually set up or either manually set up our aesthetics. We had to choose the fonts and the primary colors that would fit with the OC aesthetic as well. And second, we had to create the actual videos. So we would just divide the slides based on our video outline from before. And we would add subtitles onto the text for hearing impaired people. And then we would set the timings per slide based on the cut audio from before as well and insert that cut audio into the slides. And finally, after all of that long and tedious process, we had to polish our videos. We had to adjust the slide timing to the cut audio and then implement our peer feedback from before. So once we're finished with our video, we ask our peers to give a review on our videos and they would give that in and then we would implement it into the video. And then we would add minor designs and such. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we created our side projects. So for the infographic voiceover, we voiced ourselves recording off of an infographic that's already pre-made. Um, then we timed each slide to um, match the audio of um, the things that we were saying. And then we added animations to each slide. So for merch design, um, we had an initial meeting to discuss the general direction that we wanted to go with the merch. Um, and then we brainstormed individual ideas and produced the final product. And then for the infogra infographic creation, we worked in pairs to create short infographics, um, then met up extensively to create um, aesthetic products. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about. So the last and final part of our video making process was giving feedback to team members and acting on that feedback to make our videos perfect. The first step to giving feedback was watching our peers' videos. We watched the videos with the audience in mind, like if the videos was understandable and if it was pleasant to look at. We also had to make sure that all the videos portrayed Operation Climate's ideals. We then also gave feedback on if the existing audio needed to be changed with raw audio, if the color coordination matched with the Operation Climate's theme, and if the background music levels were okay, graphics, spacings, fonts, and more. We then took the feedback into mind and used that feedback to edit and enhance the ex ex existing video. So the results. <laughs> I think Hank is in this call, right? No? Oops, sorry, I think I accidentally skipped over Ariel's. Ariel. No, you're good, you're good. Okay, hi, I'm Ariel. So for the three subtopic videos that I was working on, the first was titled Climate Change's Impacts on Coral Reef Ecosystems. The second was titled Digital Activism, Is It Beneficial or Harmful? And the third was titled Understanding Carbon Neutrality. Um, at the bottom, you can see some screenshots of the title slide for my first video, some transition slides. And okay, so for learnings, I learned how to use um, new programs. I never knew how to use Audacity, but we got a lot of, we got a lot of experience with Audacity throughout this process. Um, I always knew how to use Canva, but I learned about the video making feature and also sticker designs and such. And through this, I got to learn a lot about the elements of graphic design. For example, color, space, size, spacing, anything. And um, I learned a lot about how tedious it is, but it's also very rewarding. And um, for a side project, I was part of a team and we were making sticker designs and you guys can see that in the bottom right corner. Next slide, please. I think Hank is having some audio issues. So yeah, we can skip over to the next one. Wait, I just wanna say first, I love this infographic and also look at my comment here. Me and all my homies love dirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, I'm Shreya and these are my subtopic videos that I created. First one I created was activism versus slacktivism, which talked about, you know, activism and versus being a fake activist. The second one was how much did COVID-19 really help reverse climate change? Because a lot of people think that it, because of like um, COVID-19, everyone's inside that climate change suddenly just disappeared, but that's not true. And that's what it talked about. And my third one was geoengineering's potential to stop climate change, which is like um, scientifically manually creating these machines, machinery and, uh, and such to reverse climate change and if it actually is useful. And my side projects along with my partner, I created the inf Instagram infographics and there were two of them. One is how COVID-19 has impacted climate change, which was based on the video from previously and the Amazon rainforest and its importance because a lot of people don't know that. And then the reflection and skills that I learned was before all of this, all I knew was for editing is just iMovies. But now I have like Canva, I have Audacity. I know how to use lettering and space and color and co color coordination and fonts and everything. And now I can actually create more videos, especially for climate change. So I feel like I can make more of an impact now than before. Next slide, please. Hello, my name is Shreya and my subtopic videos were what is climate change and how can we stop it? All about carbon neutrality and how and why some com communities have been more affected by COVID-19 than others. So what I have learned during this internship is how to use new programs. Before, before this internship, I had no idea about like Canva and Audacity. Now I just feel like more confident in my like skills that now I know how to use two of these programs well enough. And then I also learned about the basics of graphic, graphic design. And then with my um, partner, Shreya, who spoke last um, slide before, we did these two Instagram posts. So I'm Sarah, and my three subtopic videos were how climate change affects natural disasters, which mostly focus on wildfires and hurricanes, 
wildlife conservation versus climate change, which, which mostly focused on animals and some plants, but to a lesser extent, and climate change, politics and perspectives, which focused on different political perspectives. I learned a lot about different technologies while using this, like Canva and Audacity, as people have mentioned before. Um, specifically with Canva, I learned a lot about different graphic design techniques, like colors, making sure the colors coordinate with each other, and also um, I uh, represent OC correctly, different font, so coordinating different colors and um, different shapes and making sure that they don't interfere too much with the images and graphics. And then also the use of images and graphics can convey different messages, whether it's more professional, more conversational, it can really just get different moves across. And so that was a really great addition to the music during the presentations. And then I also learned a lot of just about climate change in general, both from doing individual research whenever I was working on my voiceovers and also whenever I was listening to the podcast to think of my topics. So some of the impacts it has on us, some of the impacts for the future, some possible solutions for now and for the future, and then different perspectives, whether it's political or whether it's people from different backgrounds. And for my side project, I was on the merch design team. So my sticker is down below. It is a bike with globes instead of wheels, and it says zero pollution solution to promote biking and other less um, harmful to the environment methods of transportation. Hello, I'm Grace Lee, and my subtopic videos are titled Social Media Activism, How to Not Be a Slacktivist, uh, Convincing Others to Care About Climate Change, and old growth and its role in protecting the environment. Um, my old growth video was an original video that I was super excited and grateful to have the opportunity to work on. Um, I've been keeping up with the Fairy Creek blockades for a while, which are uh, protests against logging old growth in the South Vancouver Island region. And if you don't know anything about the old growth logging in BC or just really anywhere, I really encourage that you research about it later because um, upon further research, I realize that it's a zillion times more dangerous for the climate than I initially thought. Um, so you can check my video out after. Um, okay, for my side project, I did Instagram infographic voiceovers. And as explained in an earlier slide, we took the infographics that were already on the Operation Climate Instagram and recorded voiceovers to go with them and then added some animations on Canva. The infographics I chose were deforestation, what's the big deal, and what is line three. And during the um, recording process, I learned a lot about these topics and I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. Um, and reflections. When I reflected back on my time during the OC internship, I realized I had learned and improved a lot of skills. So first is organization. I'm not a super organized person. Uh, I don't think I will ever be as organized as I'd like to be, but being on the content creation team has helped me, uh, has drastically improved my organization skills. Um, the planning we did for each of our videos and the goals we set for every week are definitely things that I will try to implement into my everyday life now. <laughs> and then editing. So during the internship, we used Canva and Audacity a lot. So it was cool learning about graphic design and using editing, editing software. Uh, I'm more tech savvy, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so that was cool. And then next is education. Uh, through peer editing and the college panels and the guest speaker events, I learned about so many things, whether it be about different impacts of and perspectives of climate change or climate solutions. And not only about climate, we didn't only learn about climate change, um, but this internship did a really great job at helping us prepare for college and our futures. So it was great to see, uh, to get insights and advice from our team leads and the guest speakers. Um, and I think now I am definitely less scared about going into my future. 
And then finally, we have teamwork. Uh, so I was always a super independent person. I never really felt comfortable just reaching out to people for help or thoughts or anything like that. But I think the best part of this internship was that it was just a super chill and comfortable environment uh, atmosphere. Because it didn't take me long to feel in place with the rest of the team. Peer editing never felt nerve wracking like I thought it would. And communication with the whole team was really good. And also, I want to thank Valerie for being a super cool and helpful team lead because she made everything feel super comfortable and I wasn't stressed at all. Thank you. Next slide. Hey everyone, my name is Steve. My name is Steven, and I'm sorry I'm unable to make it to the capstone presentation, and would have to present myself in this form. Being a member of the content creation team, I have made three videos regarding climate change: the origin of climate change, climate change and its relevance to us, and climate change during pandemic times. In addition, I also designed a sticker for my side project, merch design. The idea is to feature Operation Climate by displaying the logo in a shield, which promotes protecting the earth and our environment. By doing these many projects, I've acquired many skills, such as using Canva, Audacity, and converting YouTube videos to MP3 and MP4 files. I was no more than an amateur in the beginning, but eventually I learned to make videos, create graphic designs, import, trim, mix and download audio files using Audacity and converting YouTube videos into MP3 and MP4 files to import back into Canva. Operation Climate has taught me a lot and I am glad to have been a part of it. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Eileen Chen. So during this internship, I created three videos. Um, the first being how climate change puts the most vulnerable at risk. The second being on social media and activism. And then the third was on a film I watched. It's on Netflix, I think. It's called Seaspiracy. It's a documentary about like um, overfishing and how that impacts the climate. And I did just a, a review of the film and what you can do to help in relation to it. Um, and then for my side project, I worked on an Instagram infographic with Elizabeth on how climate change affects the Arctic. Um, going through this internship, I learned a lot just like on the technical side, on the importance of audio editing, it's like cutting out random breaths and stuff um, can really change someone's watching and um, viewing experience, as well as just working with Canva and like different techniques in both graphic design for both videos and for infographics. And then just on like a more general sense, just on topic of climate change, understanding that there's a lot of different things that can impact it and there's a lot of different aspects that go into solving the problem. So I think that just throughout like I learned a lot both technically in like making videos and editing as well as just knowledge in terms of climate change and how to work to solve it. Yeah. Hello I'm Elizabeth and for the results during this time like what was stated before I worked on video outlines and here are three pictures of my final videos. Uh, for the for my side project, I worked with my partner Eileen, and um, it was on an Instagram post like what she said before, how climate change affects the Arctic. And for reflections, my concern about climate change has definitely grown. Working through the experience, I learned many things while creating content. I recall not considering the viewer's perspective or whether I was providing um, clear information and it was like good enough for them to understand what was being discussed. I learned the value of clarity and as well as ensuring that the video was visually appealing and interesting. Overall, I had a great time and gained a lot of new skills in content creation. So I'm Jessica and being on the content creation team, I have created three different videos. Um, one covering the need for activism, another for slacktivism and digital activism, and also a video regarding talking um, to climate skeptics. As for my side project, I designed a sticker that shows the impacts of climate change um, that ha um, has on the life forms around us. 
um, therefore featuring the polar bear on the um, block of ice. And by being a member of the content creation team, I was able to become familiar with new software such as Audacity and Canva. Um, and by get getting familiar with Canva and its features, I know I'll definitely continue using that um, in the future. And this experience has also just given me insights um, to the work that goes behind content creation in general and allows me to appreciate the content we push out more. Uh, so for my videos, I made um, Finding Common Ground and Climate Change, What Does It Really Mean? Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make a third video because my computer broke and I lost all, all my progress. So yeah, that kind of sucked, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and for my side project, I did my I did an infographic voiceover. Um, so during this inter internship, I kind of learned that um, if you really want to get the message across, you need to put it in a way that's... Um, easy to understand and something that's intriguing for the general audience because obviously not everyone is going to be as interested in this topic as you know as we are or you know any anybody else who's interested who's already in, interested in environmental science and um so yeah you have, you have to get them interested you can't just expect them to you know formulate that interest out of thin air so um yeah being in this internship really taught me that you know to it taught me to use that knowledge that i already had and my passion that i already had to spread it to others and um yeah Uh, so from Hi, my name is Emily Lee, and my videos were on impacts of COVID-19 on climate change, what we can do to stop climate change, and impacts of climate change in real life. And in the middle column is, are my thumbnails of my videos, and my side project was um, merch design stickers, and on the right is like a little sticker I made. The, um, I saw like one of Operation Climate's missions is to like empower um, its audience. So uh, I, I designed a sticker based on that with like the earth and a heart around it. And my reflections are sometimes by presenting information in more diverse ways, kind of similar to Daniel's, it is easier for the audience to take in the material that is presented and also learned some basic uh, basics of how to navigate audacity. Thank you. In undergrad, I spent a lot of time studying marine biology underwater with all the who's it's and what's it galore. Instead of thingamabobs, however, I saw the incredibly saddening sight of bleaching corals turned a ghastly white. This is another symptom of climate change. Colorful corals turned white from the warming oceans and increased acidification. As you might know, the Great Barrier Reef is dying due to heat stress and the ocean is becoming more acidic. Further, about 90% of the world's coral reefs could be dead by 2050. Virtually all of the scientific community agrees that the observed increase in global average temperature is caused by human activity. A lot of it is because of a couple of things, um, fossil fuel combustion and industrial agriculture. Those are kind of been the two drivers. The ocean and so many ecosystems are already taking massive changes due to climate change. Everything is connected, so even the slightest change can ripple throughout the entire system. We are in a climate crisis, threatening not only our health and safety, but also the future generations to come. This is relevant to every single person on this planet. It's important and it's affecting us every day and will continue to affect us if we're not like making a constant change. The number one priority is reducing our carbon emissions and no matter what technology is developed, nothing can save us unless we find a way away from fossil fuels. The formal definition of geoengineering, or climate intervention, is the deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change. 
Geoengineering can be something such as planting a bunch of trees to suck up the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or it could be launching mirrors into space to reflect the sun's incoming rays. Geoengineering isn't a fix to climate change. It's just a tool that we could use in addition to mitigation. Over the past decade, scientists have developed a suite of technologies called Solar Radiation Management, or SRM, that keeps sunlight out of the atmosphere. SRM is being considered in order to preserve cooler temperatures until we can mitigate enough emissions to have these sustainable ecosystems. To try to protect both the ecosystem and the massive tourist business that it brings, Australia is currently researching a form of local SRM called marine cloud brightening. This means that special ships will take in ocean salt water and release it in a fine spray into the atmosphere. This in turn makes clouds brighter and reflects more sunlight, reducing the amount of heat the corals experience. Whoa, that was awesome. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself to say that, but that was awesome. So, sorry, before we move forward, um, I think Josh's slide was skipped. Oh, did I say before this? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then... Wait, sorry. Let me, I'm going to stop sharing and figure out what's wrong with my screen. <laughs> yeah, but um, anyways, the, those videos, basically the content creation team voted for the top three and we're showcasing uh, those right now. So the first one you saw was aerials on the coral reef ecosystems. Um, and I'll let the rest of them share those videos with you in a short minute. Sorry, sometimes when I skip it, it like skips two slides. So that's probably what happened. Here you go, Josh. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Josh. Uh, my three videos for this internship for climate change, natural or man-made. So like what even is climate change anyways? And the recycled lie, which was my independent third video. And then um, my merge team was with Emily and Jessica. Um, and here I made um, something that's meant to go on the back of the shirt. Um, and then my reflections from working on these projects were uh, first and foremost, how to make scientific concepts clear, concise, and palatable for general audiences. As you can also probably tell from um, some of the video titles that I uh, came up with. And then um, I think the other thing I really learned was how to explore more forms of digital nonfiction narrative, um, especially with my third video, which is kind of like a video essay. Here's something to think about. Only 50 years ago, people in America lived much different lifestyles and still managed to do all the things I consider part of my morning routine without single-use plastic products. How did we go from there to being the country that leads the world in per capita waste production? And what do we need to do about that? When I go back to my own experiences with single-use plastics and just how ingrained plastic has really become in the American cultural conscious, I've noticed that its consumerism hasn't been without a partner in crime, recycling. As a kid growing up in the American public school system, I think recycling was always pushed onto us as some sort of civic duty. We watched animations about it on television. We sang funny songs about the three big R's, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle during the month of March. And I think what came alongside this seemingly very environmentally friendly education was the idea that single-use plastics and planned obsolescence should be and could be normalized since we had this magical catch-all solution in recycling. But as you can probably guess, that's not really the case, is it? In an underwater paradise, a plastic nightmare. Suppose we told you that the water you drink, the air you breathe, pretty much everywhere is contaminated with plastic. Here's a fun fact the fossil fuel industry doesn't want you to know. It's almost always cheaper to create new plastic than it is to recycle it, for a few reasons. Sorting, separating, and processing trash for recyclable plastic is incredibly expensive. Plastic actually degrades every time it's reformed into something else, meaning it can only be recycled a maximum of one or two times if it's ever recycled at all. And in fact, in 2018, the EPA estimated that only 10% of all plastic ever created has ever been recycled. And what would you know, the plastics industry has known this from the start. 
When plastic first began to take hold in America in the 1940s, there was no such thing as single-use plastic products. Plastic was mostly used to make durable objects meant to last, like furniture. Rather quickly, however, manufacturers realized it would be much more profitable to get people to buy their products, dispose of them, and repeat the cycle as quickly as possible. And beginning in the 1960s, plastic began to permeate almost every aspect of American life. Despite massive environmental awareness movements, the plastic industry more or less redirected their responsibility firmly and squarely back into the hands of the consumers, not the manufacturers. They poured what accumulates into hundreds of millions of dollars over several decades into these insane advertising campaigns and projects designed to paint littering as the root of all plastic pollution. They secretly funded a non-profit organization called Keep America Beautiful, which by the way is still very much active today, um, and rolled out gems such as this 1970s PSA. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. Remember, they already knew that recycling wasn't useful or viable, but in a roundabout way, it relied on keeping this myth alive amongst consumers to keep churning profits. And I think what's really telling about how insidious this campaign was can be seen in this ad from the 70s. People start pollution. People can stop it. That's right, it wasn't the manufacturers who knew from the start that single-use plastics were unsustainable, and that recycling was for all intents and purposes a scam. And used decades of disinformation and government lobbying to hoodwink an entire nation. And produced the estimated 269,000 tons of plastic currently gunking up the ocean, who started the pollution. It was the people. Now, prior to mid-2018, the United States was notorious for exploiting countries in the global south as its personal dumping ground. In essence, we sent them all our trash. But around two years ago, the United Nations banned the sale of contaminated waste to developing nations, and then the recycling industry took a turn for the worse. With no one willing to purchase these massive bales of used plastic for the reasons we went over earlier, most of it just ended up back in, you guessed it, landfills. Out of the multiple headaches this creates for us, one of the most pressing issues is microplastics. Tiny fragments of plastic made up of chemicals linked to adverse health effects, which enter natural ecosystems and contaminate our food and water. In terms of things that we can really do about it now, it doesn't look too promising. I think removing as much plastic from the ocean as possible, and thus preventing the further production of microplastics is a reasonable place to start. And I've seen some really interesting projects that I take on that challenge. Then of course, there's a substantial push to just completely phase commercial plastic out of our lives and reduce our dependence on pan obsolescence, while lobbying industry leaders to cut back on excessive packaging and fund their own research into sustainable alternatives. But if there's one thing I've really learned from researching and immersing myself in this story, it's the danger that arises when government negligence meets corporate greed. To my fellow environmentalists, this is a chilling reminder that we're up against quite an influential and formidable force. One well, would even go so as far as to capture some monopoly on the truth. And yes, while they've capitalized off our complacency, they've also more sinisterly preyed on our good intentions and our guilt. I really hope that people can start to realize just how much power their ballots have. First, to elect politicians who will take a hard stance against industry, whether it be automobile, plastics, fossil fuel, whatever, to fight their active disinformation and to finally bring corporate accountability back to America. Because without someone keeping these extremely powerful institutions in check, all of our efforts really will have been for nothing. And this consumer manufacturer relationship that we talked about will just continue to be abused to shift responsibility for our environmental crises away from the party that's at the root of the problem. Wow. Oh, oh! <laughs> that was so good! Damn! Look, this is like Netflix documentary. Whoa! <laughs> that's awesome. Congrats, Josh. Oh, that's so cool. Ooh. Breaking into Netflix's top 10 most watched within days of release, Seaspiracy is a 2021 documentary released by filmmaker Ali Tabrizi, highlighting the gruesome workings of the fishing industry and its impact on the environment. Seaspiracy brings to light many important pieces of information on the commercial fishing industry, as well as the necessity of our oceans. Every year, at least 50 million sharks are caught in Commercial fishing was essentially wildlife poaching on a mass scale, catching up to 2.7 trillion fish every year. 
This has led to global fish populations, in some cases, plummeting to near extinction. The 46% of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is fishing nets alone. 93% of all the world's CO2 is stored in the ocean with the help of marine vegetation, algae, and coral. And losing just 1% of this ecosystem was equivalent to releasing the emissions of 97 million cars. With these numbers in mind, the film has many good takeaways. Commercial fishing heavily pollutes the ocean and devastates the greater ecosystem. Overfishing is accelerating and that our survival is dependent on the health of our waters. But before we absorb all the information from the film, it's important to do some fact checking. While Seaspiracy gets the big picture right, there's one key detail it overlooks. Sustainable fisheries. Tabrizi argues that sustainable fishing is impossible, but this remains heavily debated by activists and politicians alike, and it's important not to completely rule them out. Professor Hilborn of the University of Washington finds that while roughly 32% of fish stocks are overfished, a number that is still far too high, there is evidence that the remaining stocks are being fished responsibly. Fisheries that are certified by the Marine Stewardship Council are among the best managed fisheries in the world, he writes, and these fisheries aren't located in just America. Oceanos finds that countries with the most sustainable practices and regulations are Norway, Barbados, South Korea, Iceland, and the Philippines. Furthermore, while the film casts a shadow of doubt over the eco-labels we see on our canned fish at the grocery store, the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance points out that buying local from community-supported fisheries could be a much safer bet. Despite this detail, the film makes two very correct claims. Overfishing is a real and detrimental problem and that if we lose our oceans, we may lose ourselves. So, what can you as an individual do to help? If there's one thing to take away from the film, it's that If you want to address climate change, the first thing you do is protect the ocean. While Tabrizi concludes the film with a call to action for more humans to move to an entirely plant-based diet, among other policy changes, you don't have to give up sushi and seafood risotto to make a difference. If you can't afford to track down the source of your food, you can sign petitions and donate to ocean conservation organizations or decrease your plastic consumption to the best of your ability. And in the easiest yet most necessary way of creating change, you can start a conversation and raise awareness in your neighborhood by informing others in your community and educating yourself through monitoring the news, watching other films, and speaking to new people to learn about their perspectives. Woohoo! That was enthralling and so inspiring. I love it. <laughs> See if my page is gonna. Did I skip a slide? No, no, you're good. Yeah. So we're just gonna conclude with reflection and takeaways. Okay. So first of all, I haven't been able to see like the entirety of the two other videos, and they were really good. Okay. So for takeaways, I'm gonna be focusing on video design. So my first takeaway is that Audacity, which we use to cut our audio requires high attention to detail and the use of many tools. Um, I found myself using the envelope tool that you can adjust volume with, fade in, fade out for the background music, um, amplify to make sure these sounds are all leveled out. And there are a lot of other tools that we use. Um, so the audio snippets have to be cut and timed down to even like the 10th of a second. It can be really precise. For example, if you're cutting off right when a person begins like a new th train of thought, you have to make sure that sometimes it can be a little bit choppy. So you have to um, be sure to appropriately insert pauses and just have a really good timing and pace. So the background music also must be inserted and the volume has to be appropriately adjusted so that it doesn't overpower the person's talking. And um, my second takeaway is that visual visuals and audio must be timed correctly. So um, we basically imported the audio into Canva. So we had to make sure that our video pauses were long enough so that the transition can take place and the text would come in like right when the um, speaker began speaking. 
So yeah, that required a lot of precise editing and a lot of transitions. For example, some transitions would take longer times than others. So you just have to kind of play around with a lot to see what works the best for your video. And the third takeaway is that graphic design has many elements. Um, to make a very aesthetic piece takes a lot of work and consideration. You have to play around with a lot of different color palettes, um, text sizes and element placement. Another huge thing is that for something to be very attention grabbing and um, to keep a viewer's attention, uh, you can't have too much information on one slide, which is what I struggle with a little bit. But um, with a lot of editing and a lot of peer reviewing, you learn how to appropriately put a good amount of um, information on each slide and insert animations and videos that keep it interesting. Next slide, please. So another one of our takeaways was uh, that learning through working on our subtopic videos and doing additional independent research, um, I think we were all able to gain a deeper understanding of how uh, environmental science and studies intersected with all these fascinating fields, um, including but not limited to politics, activism, social justice, communication, and public health. Um, and likewise, I think the Friday Speaker series mirrored this, and it also helped us see how professionals um, apply these fields and disciplines in their lives after they left high school and after they left college. Um, some of the standouts for us were the careers in sustainability, environmental journalism, climate activism, and science communication through social media. So in addition to Valerie's suggestions on our uh, video projects, we also reviewed each other's works and gave encouragements as well as constructive criticisms. And I think it is really helpful to improving our videos since like more pairs of eyes is better than one. With more people providing advice, mistakes that are easy to miss can be spotted and resolved. And by looking at other interns work, I am also inspired by their creativity um, and their design and layout. And in terms of, uh, in terms of communication, I find that the, the reaction button has been very helpful to let team neither to let team leaders know that we have read their message. And I'm so grateful for of oh, team members, I made a typo, sorry, who reached out and created small groups for better communication on site projects and presentation work distribution. So this is Hank's slide, but I think Hank has audio issues. So it's okay. With Operation Climate coming to an end, our 13 members of content creation team have each made three videos, adding up to 39 videos in total. Our videos cover a myriad of topics ranging from what climate change is to the impact and to the solution and etc. Furthermore, everyone has had significant contribution to their designated side project. Whether it's making infographic, doing voiceovers, or merch, merch design. Tallying up everyone's volunteer logs, our content creation team has dedicated over 540 hours of work time. Once again, I am truly sorry for my absence. Here, I would like to thank all my peers and instructors for this wonderful experience. It's been great working with everyone. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we're just going to conclude with content creation now and do a quick five minute break. <laughs> um, yeah, so people uh, go to the restroom, take a glass of water, whatever you need, um, and then we will resume with research and databases presentation. Oh, this is the uh, capstone presentation. Can I switch devices? Because uh, mine doesn't have a camera right now to switch. Can I? Oh, no, you're good. You're good. It, uh, as long as. Yeah, as long as you can talk over your slide, that's good. Wow, yeah. you're on your ASUS, aren't you? Sure, yeah. But uh, yeah, so this is the capstone presentation for the research team. Um, we we're going to be researching database, and now we're a research team, because that just kind of um, 
captures what we've been doing this summer. Uh, let me try to click. Okay, so kind of an overview of our summer work. Um, I'll hand it over to Sadie in a second, but um, we we the our presentation today is going to be more individual reflection based, um, especially because we've been doing some individual projects, which are really cool and really fascinating, and I'm excited for you guys to hear about. So without further ado, I'll let Sadie um, go over what we've been doing. Okay, so um, the first thing we've kind of been doing is literature reviews. We've done detailed analyses and we were split into two different teams, one team on climate attitudes and one team on environmental education. And we basically analyzed um, sentences that highlighted both fact-based and um, emotional-based, so emotion-based um, things that we found in our research. And then we created a white paper uh, full of paragraphs and we kind of helped each other make transitions um, around these logos and pathos sentences. And we created a first full draft of the white paper to make recommendations on how to improve um, education and attitudes surrounding climate change. And then we all have our own individual projects that you'll hear more about when we each present. <laughs> So I'm actually first. <laughs> so um, through um, my individual research, I was able to look at a bunch of different articles on Google Scholar. I learned how to search on Google Scholar, which I previously didn't know how to do. And um, I took at least one page of notes for each article. And I noticed that my notes improved over the course of um, the internship just because I was able to learn how to narrow down what information I needed and what was most important for what I was looking for. And then I was also able to peer edit other people's sentences, which kind of helped me improve my own because I was looking at what they were doing and then um, was able to see what I should be doing or what I could be doing better. And then I was also able to edit theirs, which, um, and then they edited mine too, which was helpful. And my favorite part was being able to connect with so many different people um, on my team and then other teams and the team leaders. And I loved attending the speaker events and the workshops. And so my personal, I have a white paper paragraph up there, which is just one of them. And um, the red sentences are the logos and pathos sentences that we created. And then the other two, the blue sentences are kind of our opening and closing sentences. This one was about how farmers um, were, uh, were categorized as separate from the public because they didn't really care about climate change. And then my research project has really been about um, what parts of the brain um, are activated when we think about um, subjects that are abstract, such as climate change. And so the stuff that I've been really looking at is the um, medial, prefrontal prefrontal cortex sorry that's a lot but um so basically when you think about yourself um like stuff that happens to you directly and how you're directly affected by something um that part of the brain lights up but when you um think about something that's like super abstract such as climate change it's hard for that part of the brain to process it so you don't care as much so that's kind of been the issue right now is that a lot of people want to take action, but they just generally their brains can't process it. Um, so they can't care as much about it. So that's been really interesting for me to research about. I really loved it. So next slide. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Shio Patel. I'm a high school student at Hoggard High School in Wilmington. You probably know me from some of the OC live events. So as Sadie said, she said most of what we did, but I'll say what my favorite part was. I liked doing the peer reviewing and cross-referencing because I liked to see what other people had written and doing that allowed me to improve my own researching skills and constructing my own logos, pathos, and ethos sentences. Um, I was part of the environmental education team and we did use uh, credible articles. I used most of mine from Google Scholar uh, my own re individual research project was on the wood pellet industry, which is like an industry that claims to be a renewable and net zero. Okay, so I'll go into more detail, but it's like an industry where they cut down trees to make pellets, which they export to other countries.
countries like in Europe to use as energy. But the reason why it's a problem is because the process is actually worse than burning fossil fuels because uh, millions of tons of carbon from old growth trees are released into the atmosphere. And when they plant new pine trees, that doesn't recompensate for the amount of carbon already lost. And also there's a humongous loss of biodiversity. Um, and overall, that's just a glimpse of my research project. But if you wanna look more into it, there's the link over here in the article and you can always feel free to contact me anytime if you wanna learn more about the industry. Uh, and I really love this internship because of our organized tasks every week the synchronous weekly guest speaker sessions and also because we were able to collaborate with our peers. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll be able to stay involved with you guys in the future. Hey, Sheila, would you mind um, throwing that link in the chat when you get a chance? Oh yeah. People can go check it out. Yeah. Well. Cool. I'm Carter and I really enjoyed my time as an operation climate intern. During this internship, I used Google Scholar to review research papers written by esteemed scientists and professors. I also wrote logos, pathos, and ethos sentences for each paper, analyzed, collaborated with other interns to write our white paper, and investigated how companies utilize carbon offsets. During my internship with Operation Climate, I've increased my understanding of climate change and the problems it is causing in our lives. The valuable research skills I have learned during this internship will aid me in both college and beyond. The screenshot I included is of my logos, pathos, and ethos sentences that I wrote while summarizing a research paper by Carrie Funk. And then Autria is currently out of the country, so I'll kind of step in for hers. But um, she says that throughout the summer, she became more proficient at research on a large scale um, because she was given the freedom to research personal projects, as well as kind of developing public speaking skills and workshops and working as, as part of a team, as part of a research team. Um, as, as the team lead, I was able to kind of supervise and, and help mentor people's individual research projects. So. I can say that I'm, I'm excited about Autria. She's gonna be going to Villanova University in the fall um, and going to be taking some of this research with her when, when cold emailing professors or talking to new people. And she's really interested in, in nuclear fusion um, rather than fission, which is um, kind of the, the typical thing of nuclear energy. There's a new concept of fusion that's, to, that's only um, kind of only pioneered by the French, um, I believe at this point, um, there's one one react, one react plant that currently does nuclear fusion. Um, so it's gonna be a really interesting energy source as we move forward in clean energy talks. Um, but she, she kind of concludes that it's been an eye-opening experience because she felt like she was making a difference and, and receiving experience in the field that she wants to continue into, um, especially with research in college. and over the course of this internship I've been able to greatly build my researching skills by efficiently learning how to write notes and learning new ways to find articles and journals and also write formal pieces with the intent to inform and persuade with the help of my peers who are also very passionate about the same topics and issues as me I was able to get very inspired and work a lot harder and with the help of our team lead we were able to do extensive research, which you can see on the left picture, and then we turned that into a digestible paragraph, which you can see in the right picture. And with a collection of paragraphs, we have been working on writing a full paper, which hopefully will be completed within the next few weeks. And overall, this internship has been a great experience for me. I have gained so many different perspectives on the environment and careers in the environment. And with my individual project, I'm hoping to continue working with members of the Sierra Club and hopefully connect that to the members of my own, my school's environmental club. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Kishlai. Um, I really enjoyed this internship because I was able to uh, do a lot of research, which is something that I've been looking forward to do, especially this summer before uh, my senior year of high school. And um, I really enjoyed being able to work with a lot of different people because I'm from Texas and uh, most of my team was from pl uh, places that I never would have been able to go to beforehand. Um, and then on some of the pictures are one of the final paragraphs that talks about why it's so hard to pass policies in um, Congress for climate change, as well as some more notes. And then my personal project is reaching out to large Instagram and Twitter pages uh, to see the effect that social activism can have on uh, climate change and see how we can like make bigger changes in the future. My name is Hugh, and um, throughout the internship, I I just learned how to use Zotero, Google Scholar, um, and like all um all, I learned those uh, note taking skills to like help better um help better myself with writing notes. And um, in the one of like the middle in the middle photo, you can see like one of one of my notes that has a graph, and then uh the one right next to it. On the right side, it's a rough draft of my paragraph uh, that had the the pathos and logo sentences, and which are in red. And then the blue are the blue sentences are the ones I added to make it a coherent. And my uh, my research project is about the right to repair movement, which uh, which it talks which is uh, which talks about how companies don't allow the consumers to repair their own devices and want them to buy their devices or fix their devices, which cost money. And if people just throw their previous devices away, it causes um, a high amount of e-waste, especially in the United States and like other countries. Awesome. Yeah, Hugh actually came to me with the right to repair idea. And then about a few weeks into the internship, Steve Wozniak of Apple was kind of largely cited in an interview about talking about right to repair. So we'll see if Apple deviates from the normal ways or not <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Matthew and I'm currently a rising junior at Valencia High. Uh, this summer I was on the climate attitudes team and more specifically, I really enjoyed researching renewable energy and like how other people viewed it. Um, over this summer, I had to take general notes and write logos, ethos and pathos statements. And what I thought was cool was that I didn't really have a strict schedule and like I was able to manage my own time. And I think this really helped me because a lot of people, including like our um, team leaders have said that the biggest difference between college and high school is that like your teachers don't really hold your hands the whole way through. So I thought it like got me to become more independent and really helped me in that way. And for my side project, I decided to go with something called Pygro. Essentially, PyGro uses a Raspberry Pi and humidity sensors to help monitor and control the growth of plants. I'm still in the process of putting it all together, but I was able to learn how to work with Linux, which is an open source operating system, as well as working with hardware like wiring relay modules with the Raspberry Pi. Oh, next slide. Hi, I'm Dee. So over the summer, I worked on the environmental education team. And so I researched the current state of environmental education and how it can be improved. Additionally, I also conducted an individual research project on climate policy, more specifically on Governor Cooper's Executive Order 80, in which he proposes three goals by which he wants to accomplish by 2025. And so I researched the plans that are currently in place to accomplish those goals and also what policies that could be further implemented to accomplish the goals more efficiently. Um, over the summer, I was able to develop my research and analyzation skills, which will be very useful in the future. And I really like the format of this internship because I was able to gain experience in working with on a research team. And I also was able to explore a research topic that I was very interested in. Hi, my name is Shrika and I was part of the Attitudes team. 
and um, I gained a lot of experience over the summer. I obtained skills which will be used throughout my career and skills I will need throughout my life. I learned how to use multiple resources to find the information that I needed and how to analyze those sources. Along with that, I understood the importance of time management, how to take good notes and how to ask the right questions. Most importantly, I learned how to collaborate with others and come up with great ideas. Along with doing research about attitudes towards climate change, I individually was working on a research project about the effects of climate change toward medical treatment. Throughout this project, I had, I had the opportunity to talk with many amazing doctors and learn their perspectives on this issue. I also have to give a huge thanks to the people I worked with because it was definitely an eye-opening experience since everyone had their own ideas and opinions, which helped me improve myself a lot. Throughout this internship, I got the opportunity to be a part of a lot of new things such as the environmental club of my school and I got to meet a lot of new people. This internship was definitely amazing because I gained experience which I doubt I'll get anywhere else. On this side there are pictures of the work I've done throughout the summer. The first one is a screenshot of my ethos, pathos, and logo sentences for one of the articles that I analyzed. The next one is a paragraph which is about my observation of a couple graphs and the final one is a table about the relation between re re uh, religion and climate change which was a very interesting article to read. Hi, my name is Siri, and this summer I was a part of the Attitudes team, and this experience as a whole taught me a lot. I not only learned how to do things such as analyze articles, find reliable information, and write good notes, but I also learned how to utilize these skills to create a product that can promote change and, ed and educate others. I also learned skills such as time management and teamwork, which are, gonna, are things that are going to help me through my life. During this internship, I really enjoyed working with my team members, and it was a really good experience where I was able to collaborate with other people to a great, achieve great results. Also, the individual project gave me an opportunity to explore a topic, the loss of biodiversity in the Arctic, that was important to me, which was really interesting because I was able to talk to professionals and also analyze data to start creating my own tangible result that could possibly make a change. As a whole, this internship gave me a lot of invaluable experiences that are going to be helpful in my future. In the first picture, those are my logos and pathos sentences for a page of notes I took about the different generations and their attitudes towards climate change that I found really interesting. In the second picture is one of my slides for my individual project where I had an explanation as to why someone should care about the loss of biodiversity in the Arctic. Hi, I'm Joseph. I'm part of the Attitudes team. Throughout the summer, I, I did research on articles for white papers and wrote logos, pathos, and ethos sentences. Throughout my time at the OC 2021, uh, 2021, I have developed many new skills. I learned that Google Scholar is a very reliable site for finding articles. Another thing that I learned is how to write logos, pathos, and ethos sentences. Uh, the picture on the top right is an article that I researched on um, that showed how more developed places are more aware of climate change when compared to like less developed places. On the bottom is a picture of my logos, pathos, and ethos sentences. Overall, this internship was definitely something valuable and I gained many knowledge on how to collect data and research them, which will for sure benefit me in the future. So just as a kind of wrap up and what's next, um, we have our white paper, um, we're, we're, our, we have our first draft and we're of both teams, we're gonna put out a white paper on environmental education and on climate attitudes. Um, over the next few weeks, a few people from the team have volunteered to meet once a week beyond the internship and really finish up with these draft revisions and locate places where we can publish this. Um, so everybody that's on that wrote uh, white papers this summer will be on a published article somewhere, um, which will kind of help their research experience and credibility going forward. And along with individual projects, those will go on for months, years, however it may, may be, um, through o Operation Climate Mentorship. So we're really excited for what turns out um, and excited to share the, the results of both our white papers and our individual projects as they come up to, to the group. Wow, so exciting. Okay, let me um, share real quick. 
I know we are on a time crunch here, but uh, we're gonna try to speed through certifications. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Catherine first because I think podcast team certificates are organized and then I'll go and then Matthew. Yes, would like to recognize all the wonderful members of the podcast team. First, Caroline Chen, congratulations for completing the OC internship program. Congratulations to Grace Jang for also completing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say their names. <laughs> Congratulations to Marissa Sims. Congratulations to Arsha Gorian. Congratulations to Epi Camacho. Congratulations to Raga Vakula. Congratulations to William Thai. And congratulations to Madeline Bloomfield. Yay. Okay. So um, now we're on to content creation. I'm just going to do the same thing to recognize you guys. But first is Tria. Congratulations for completing the OC internship. Uh, next is Sarah Bigley. Congratulations. Eileen Chen. Again, congratulations on completing the internship. And Ariel Kim. Congratulations. Jessica Shang. Congrats again. <laughs> Everyone congrats, basically. Daniel's not here, but um, congrats to Daniel. Uh, congrats to Elizabeth, Leo. Congrats to Grace Lee. Congrats to Stephen Chen, who's not here, but it's okay. Um, congratulations to Emily Lee. Congratulations to Joshua Cho. And congratulations to Shreya. That just, oh no, Hank. And congratulations to Hank, Hank Hudson. Okay, so to wrap it up, research team, congratulations to Hugh Moon. Congrats to Sheil Patel. Atria Aiden, congrats on completing. D, congrats, D Leggard. Congrats to Matthew Cheng. And Siri, congrats, Siri Chandulu. Harrison Carter, congrats. Terrence Wu, congrats. He's currently in the Ed Cook Islands. <laughs> uh, congrats, Joseph Lowe. Juju Lee, congrats on completion. Shrika Balaji, congrats. Congrats to Wayne Wu. Congrats to Sadie Dunn. Congrats to Kishlaira Rostogi. Yay. Okay. Congrats to all of Congrats you guys. Everyone. <laughs> we'll we send, send you send the out, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll send out certificates um by the end of the week soon. So look out for those, but wanted to recognize you um on the capstone. But um yeah, we're gonna close really quickly with the raffle prize winner. We're gonna do a, a live raffle that Catherine has prepared. Um, but we never told you guys the prize. So the prize is a $25 gift card to Patagonia, um, which is a member of like, was it 1% uh, for the planet? I think um, a lot of sustainable stuff. So we thought it'd be appropriate to gift that to you guys. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hand it off to Catherine. Awesome. Okay. So oh, wait, let me, can I share my, my screen so y'all can see me doing the, the thing? Yes. This is a spreadsheet. I have all the interns of the week written on here. Um, this is a random number generator. Do you guys see it? E. Okay. Drum roll. <laughs> I'm going to generate the number. Let's go. And it was 15, which is D. So congratulations, D. Congrats. Patagonia card. Valerie will email that to you um, by the end of this week. Yes. Um... I have, to, okay, going back to my screen share. Okay, finally, closing. Um, so we have a small reflection prepared for you guys. Um, if Matthew or Catherine could send that in the chat, that'd be awesome. But uh, it's a really simple survey, like I think 10 questions and they're like multiple choice. So um, if you guys could fill that out for us right now, that'd be awesome. Should take no less than like two minutes. Do you also want to drop the testimonial um, 
link in case anybody wants to provide a testimonial. We want everyone to fill out this quick survey, um, but if you'd like to give a further testimonial, um, the link is in the Slack um, with the interns that Catherine just sent out today. Um, if you'd like to elaborate a little bit on your experience and tell us, tell us what you think. Here is the, yeah, so Matthew just sent the survey that we want you guys to all fill out. And then here is the testimonial form if you would like to provide a testimonial for us. We should also take a picture, guys. Oh, yeah. We have to take a picture. So get ready to turn your cameras on, guys, if you can, if you're in a place that you, where you can. Yeah. We will do that at the end. Get ready, Hugh. <laughs> yeah, I'll switch, join in on a device. device with the camera. Yeah. Give like two minutes for the reflection. But yeah, it was it was very cool to hear all of you guys present on your projects. I I'm very amazed and impressed. <laughs> We'll just give everyone one more minute because I already have 12 responses. So um, just one more minute, try to just give us some honest feedback. Yeah. We won't take, we don't take your name so you can <laughs> crush our spirits if you need, if you really need to. Are we all doing filters? Wow. Wait, I can't, I can't reach That's, my filters. Yeah. Said. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to just move on now, but um, you guys can continue to fill out the reflection as we go on. So, yeah. Um, next slide. So, um, given that this is the end of our internship, uh, we've actually prepared a gift from us to all of you guys. And that is 36 trees planted in your name in 36 different states and countries around the world. So if you haven't received an email by now, you should have from One Tree Planted. But um, this is just proof that we, we did it. Um, but yeah, so this is India, Tanzania, Uganda, Peru, blah, 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 all of these names. <laughs> Ghana, um, wow, too fast, Kenya, Colombia, Ethiopia. Um, yeah, a lot. So, um, we hope you guys enjoy the gift. It's, um, from Operation Climate to all of you guys to thank you for all of the work that you guys have contributed to forwarding our mission. Um, yeah. And we just thought it'd be a cute, like thing for, for you guys, a tree planted in your name. Um, and yeah, so final steps, uh, reach out to us if you're interested in continuing your work with us as an ambassador. So here's the form, but this is also pinned in our interns channel in the Slack. So um, fill that out uh, so that we know where to send further details to. And yeah, stay in touch with us, with all of us as team leads. We'd love to hear uh, where you're going, You know, if you're heading to college, where you'll be or what you're doing. Uh, we really want to keep in touch with you guys and see the work um, that you're, you're doing throughout your life. Um, yeah, so don't be shy. Reach out to us. We are always here for you guys. Um, and stay tuned because all of the work that you guys have contributed, no matter what team, is going to be used in our launch this fall. So it's either in uh, the upcoming seasons on the Operation Climate podcast, content creation videos on our YouTube channel, or the white papers to be published on our website and other uh, further publications. So yeah, everything you guys did, we're definitely going to use um, and we are extremely proud of everyone. 
with a short pause, I would like to take the opportunity to also express how proud I am of every single one of you. Um, this has been such an amazing experience for Valerie, Matthew, and I, definitely. Um, and it's been so great to get to work with all of you, like youth from all around the world. So, and you guys have accomplished so much. I love seeing all of your presentations. And I really hope you stay in contact with us in the future because we would love to support you on your climate journey. Um, even when you're like, a hundred, because I'll still be alive then. I'm going to live until I'm 112. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Question? Thank you guys. Thank you for all being here. Like, this is something that, like <laughs> Valerie said, <laughs> we started the year, but you guys have made this a great summer. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, and Emily, yes, I will. I will send these photos in the, um, in our intern channel. So fear not. But yeah, thank you, everyone. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Keep in touch. You. Bye. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank, thank you so you. much.